Matrix and welcome to Was a Matrix. My name is Looney and today we're focusing on your exam prep for business studies. All you need to do to get your questions and comments through to us is search for Was a Matrix on all our social media platforms as well as hit us up on our WhatsApp line. All of the details are on the screen. We've got a cool competition going on for you guys so please stay tuned to get all of those details later on in the show. I've got my favorite sign language interpreter with me today, Nicoline, as well as our awesome teacher, Dave. Thank you so much, guys, and over to you. Hi, Matrix. Welcome to Business Studies. Today, we'll be focusing on Paper 1 with an emphasis on business operations. So let's go through all the questions and see where we can help you guys. All right, so question 1 has got to do with Khan Private Hospital has advertised the vacancy, right? So we know we're dealing with human resources here. For a nurse, right, the advertisement includes the following aspects regarding the position. So the applicants must have a diploma, quite important there, in nursing um, as, your, as their minimum requirements. Uh, they are responsible for observing patients and for giving medication. Then you have to have at least two years experience in nursing will be uh, an advantage and then compiling daily reports on the progress of the patients. The advertisement indicates that only shortlisted candidates will be contacted for an interview. So if we look there, we've seen there, there's a couple of, of, of elements there that, that they are discussing, the focus on uh, human resources. So now we're going to see what the question is actually going to ask from us. Ah, so it says, quote, two examples of job description and two examples of job specification from the scenario above. All right, so remember job description, right? That's got to do with what you're actually going to be doing in the job. So yeah, the day-to-day -day, um, functions that you'll have by doing that job. And then we have the job specification here, which is what do you need to actually do the job? All right, so what qualifications, what experience do you actually need that you, can, uh, that you can do this job? So now you've got to make sure that you can satisfy the, the job specification so that you can actually apply for this job and perform the job description. So let's see what, uh, what the answer is here. All right, so the first one for the job, de do job description, you're responsible for observing patients and for giving out medication. All right, don't forget to uh, make sure that you, that you quote. Right. The next one for your job description is compiling daily reports on the progress of the patients. Also, do not forget to, uh, to insert your quotation marks. So the job description is what are you actually going to be doing in that job? So you can see, right, is that something that you want to be doing? Now we're going to go on to the job specification. Right, so applicants must have a diploma in nursing as a minimum requirement. All right, so you can't have a, a diploma in teaching because the position has got to do with nursing. All right, so the minimum specification that you must have is a, is a diploma in, no, in nursing as well as a minimum of two years experience. All right, also don't forget to add in your quotation marks. You don't want to lose unnecessary marks there. Then the final one is two years experience in nursing will be an advantage. All right, don't forget your quotation marks there. So here they, they're talking about what, uh, what experience you need. So they, they're obviously not looking for someone who's just finished um, uh, their, their tertiary education. They're looking for someone that has a bit more experience. So that's the specifics of the job, what you need in order to be able to do the job. All right, so if we look at the, uh, the next question, it is explain the role of the interviewee or the applicant during the interview. All right, so the interviewee would be the person that is actually going for the interview there. So if we look, first since you have all, greet the interviewer by name with a solid handshake and a friendly smile. All right, so when, when you go in there, uh, make sure that you're confident. Um, unfortunately, uh, when, when it's uh, COVID times, they might be a little bit difficult to, to shake someone's hand. You might just have to give them uh, the, the elbow. Um, otherwise, during normal times, you go out, you, you make a, a firm handshake, 
and, uh, and you greet uh, the, the interviewer with a smile. So it shows that you're confident and it shows that you're actually happy to be there. Uh, listen carefully to the questions before, before responding. Right? So you have to make sure that you understand what they're actually asking uh, from you. Right? Don't um, try and, uh, and, and guess what, what they want there. So listen carefully to what the questions are asking. They're going to see, right, are you, are you detail orientated there? Uh, make sure that you make eye contact and have a good posture or, or, or body language. Uh, so you don't want to be looking down where you're looking timid. You want to keep eye contact with the, the interviewer and you want to have a, a positive body language. Right? If, you, if you're crossing your arms and you're, and you're looking away and you're looking disinterested, that's not going to be a, a good reflection of you in your interview. So they want positive body language. They want to see that you, that you open up and uh, that you can maintain eye contact. Right, show confidence and have a positive attitude and be assertive. Right, people want to employ people that are, that are confident, that know what they're doing, that are positive. No one wants to be around someone that's negative the whole time. So you're trying to put your best foot forward in this interview, so you have to be positive and you have to be confident because if you're not confident and you don't believe in yourself, how can you expect other people to believe in you? Um, be inquisitive and show interest in the business. Right, so, so ask questions about the business. Right? Does the business have any, what, what are their goals for, for the future? Um, do they have anything exciting that's, that's coming out there? So ask questions about the business. Because if you want to work there, you have to show that you actually have an interest there. You want to be there. If you're not going to ask any questions and you don't show an interest, the interviewer is going to be like, well, this person doesn't want to be here because if they wanted to be here, they would know a lot more about what's happening in the company and they would ask questions about what's going to happen in the company. Ask clarity-seeking questions. So if you, if you don't understand something, perhaps like the working hours or, or, travel, or traveling, Right, so ask questions that are going to provide clarity for you. You also don't want to be left in a situation where you really want to know something about the business, but you never ask them, and the first time you find out is when you actually start work at the business there, because you might not have gone to that company had you known that they operated in that way. So ask questions for clarity. It's going to be good for you, and it's also going to be good for the employer. All right. Show respect and treat the interview with its due importance. Uh, so you're not going to uh, go to an interview like you've just come from a party. Right? You're going to dress accordingly. You're going to make sure that uh, you are professionally dressed. You'd rather be overdressed than underdressed. Uh, you're going to make sure that uh, you've got uh, clean clothes. Everything is, is ironed and that you're looking uh, very respectable. Right? If you go to an interview and you look messy, Right, the interviewer is going to think that you're a waste of time and they're not even going to consider you. Right. Be honest about mistakes and explain how you dealt with it. Right, okay. the, um, the interviewer wants to see, right, can you take accountability? Are you honest about your mistakes and how you, and how you dealt with them? And we're human, so we all make mistakes. It's how we deal with those mistakes and how we bounce back from those mistakes that are of vital importance. Do not lie in the interview and admit that you haven't made any mistakes because if it comes out after the interview that you've lied, right, they will definitely not want you to work there. So you want to make sure that you are as honest as possible and admit when you've made a mistake and how you dealt with it because you might get the respect of the interviewer by, by being able to admit that. Right. Know your strengths and weaknesses and be prepared to discuss it. Right. It's... Uh, Everyone likes to go on about their strengths, about what they're really good at, and uh, humans, we don't really like to discuss our, our weaknesses, where it's very important that you're able to know your strengths and your weaknesses, and you can discuss that with your, with your potential uh, employer in the interview. So your strengths are gonna sell you, and your weaknesses will show that you've done that introspection on yourself, and that you're able to actually say, right, this is my weakness, this is where I can be better at, and that just brings that whole trust and, uh, and understanding and honesty to, uh, to the table. Right, and then finally, once the interview is over, thank the interviewer for the opportunity given 
to be a part of, of the interviews. All right, so you're going to learn a lot uh, about yourself in the interview process, and you must thank the people for, for allowing you that opportunity, because even though you might not have got uh, the job, you've still learned a lot about yourself, and you've gone through this whole process. Right? And maybe during the interview process, you would have seen that there's a weakness that you need to address, and now you know for your next job interview what that weakness is and how you can address it. Ah, so if we go on to the, the next question, outline the purpose of induction as a human resources activity. All right, so induction is when people first start uh, to, to join the organization. So we go around and we show them how the organization works and you explain different, uh, different um, uh, aspects of the business to, to the employees. So let's see what the answer has to say. So firstly, introduce, introduce new employees to management or colleagues to establish relationships with fellow colleagues at different levels. All right, so when you think of it, think of it as your, as your first day of high school. You might have gone to a high school where, where you didn't know anyone um, from, uh, from your primary school, so you felt very alone there, where an induction process helps introduce the new people to their colleagues and to their management so that they feel a little less alone, they can feel a little bit more confident um, uh, in the business. All right, so you must create opportunities for the new employee to experience or explore different departments so you can show them where to go around the business, what to do uh, in the business, uh, which department uh, is where so that they can feel a little bit more confident as they're going around the organization. Uh, explain any safety regulations and rules so that the new employee will understand their roles and responsibilities in this regard, especially if you're dealing in a factory in terms of, uh, of um, chemicals where there's very strict protocols when you enter the business. You might have to go through a breathalyzer or, or they test you in, in other ways to make sure that you adhere to the safety of the organization. Right, uh, communicate or inform about uh, the product or services. So every employee needs to know, right, what are the products or services that we produce? How do they work? Who are they um, being targeted at? So that if someone asks the new employee about the products or services, a potential customer, they can answer them. There's nothing worse when a customer goes and asks someone uh, about a new product or service, and then they cannot uh, tell them anything about that. Allow the new employees the opportunity to ask questions that will put them at ease and reduce insecurity or any uh, anxiety or fear. Right, so they're going to have questions because they knew there. Allow them to ask those questions. If you allow them to ask those questions, it's going to make them feel a lot more secure and comfortable, which means they're going to be productive quicker. Right. Make the new employees feel welcome by introducing them to their, their physical workspace. Right, so they know right, this is where we're going to be working. Right, this is your space here. So they're going to feel comfortable that that's their little part of the business. Right, give the, the new employees a tour and informing them about the layout of the building or the office. Improve skills through in-service training. Right, so the new employee might uh, go on training on, on how to, to function in the, in the organization, uh, which is going to upskill them. Right, familiarize yourself with new employees with the organizational structure and their supervisors. So who is the boss? Who is the line manager? If there's a problem, who must you go and talk to? Um, ensure that the new employees understand their, their roles and responsibilities, that they will be more efficient or productive. Right, so you can be like, right, your role is head of, is head of sales, so make sure that you um, understand what, what your role entails and what you must do. So it's going to get, we want to try and get them as productive as quickly as possible. Right, and then we must communicate business policies regarding ethical and professional conduct and procedures and employment contract and conditions of employment. So we're going to make sure that they understand how the business wants to do things, what is our ethical um, um, stand on, on various points of view, and make sure that the, the new employee understands that so that they don't do anything that is against the, the, the ethics of the, of the organization. All right, so uh, Looney, uh, thank you very much, and back to you. Thank you, Dave. Matrix, we are going to take a quick break, so please don't go anywhere. We'll see you shortly after this. Welcome back from the break. 
Algorithmic Tricks. If you've just joined us, we are still doing your exam prep to help you with the upcoming exams. If you're constantly running out of data, then this next competition is just for you. Wazimatrix is bringing you the hashtag Wazawina competition, where two lucky matriculants stand a chance to win two gigs of data. So all you need to do to enter is head on over to our Facebook page and all of the details will be there. Thank you so much, Dave, and over to you. Our matrix, we're going to be carrying on with business studies paper one with the focus on business operations. We're now going to go on to question three. Uh, so the question is, discuss the implications of the Skills Development Act of 1998 on the human resources function. Uh, so I've, I've told you continuously, make sure that you understand what the different acts are about and don't confuse them. This is a question that can confuse um, a lot of learners. They'll either put in uh, the broad-based Black Economic Empowerment Act, discuss that, or the Employment Equity Act, or the Basic Conditions of Employment Act, which is not what the question is asking. So make sure that you understand the different acts. So now we're talking about the Skill Development Act and how it's going to impact human resources. So first, the human, the human resources function should interpret the aims and requirements of the Skills Development Act and adapt workplace skills training programs accordingly. All right, so you have to see, right, what does the Skills Development Act want? Right, and how can we make sure that we fulfill what the Act wants with our, with our training in the workplace? So that our training isn't going against the Skills Development Act that is working with the Skills Development Act. Secondly, we must identify the training needs of the employees and provide them with training opportunities so that they will perform their tasks efficiently. So when you see, right, what, uh, what skills do our employees need? Right, uh, they may be lacking in how to use um, Zoom um, or, or how to connect with uh, their, their fellow uh, employees over digital platforms, right, so now we know, okay, we need to ensure that we send all of our employees on, uh, on skills development that's gonna make them more efficient in the workplace. So we're gonna see, right, what do we need? How can we offer them that training, which is going to make the employees a lot more efficient in the workplace. More efficient employees means more productivity, higher productivity is higher profitability. So you can see how all of those are linked there. Um, we use the National Qualification Framework, or NQF, to assess the skills levels of, of employees. Uh, so we can see, right, what, uh, what uh, NQF level are these employees at, so we can't um, make them skip a whole bunch of NQF levels. So we have to scaffold and build on previous um, NQF levels that, that the employees uh, might have, and then we can progress them further up there. Right, we have to interpret or implement the aims or requirements of the framework for the National Skills Development Strategy. Um, and then we have to assist the managers in identifying skills or training needs to help them introduce learnerships. So a learnership would be uh, where potentially um, a student might come in and they can learn um, on, uh, on the job. There's also um, a, a theory component of that. So I'll see, right, what can we do to bring in these learnerships. Um, the business should contribute 1% of their salary bill to the skills development levy. Right, so I'll say, right, 1% of how much we pay our entire workforce will then go to the skills development levy. Right? So that's how the skills development levy is going to get their, their money from the business. We must ensure training in the workplace is, for, is formalized or structured so there must be a theory component, there must be a practical component, so it has to be formalized. So you can't just come in and be like, okay guys, today we're gonna teach you how to make a, a peanut butter sandwich, and you're dealing with computer programming. There's nothing formalized about that, so they must, uh, employees must, at the end of that, be able, at the end of their training, they get a certificate where it says, right, this, this person has attended this training, and uh, they have passed, so it's very formal um, and, and structured. Um, you might have to appoint a full-time or part-time consultant as a skills development facilitator. So in terms of your, your smaller companies, they might not know how to 
how to facilitate all this skills training. So you might have to get a, a consultant that comes in and, is, and they'll tell you, right, you need to make sure that you do this for your company. You need to make sure that you do that, right? Or if you're a big enough company, you can have a permanent consultant which will help you. All right, uh, our next question is evaluate the impact of fringe benefits on a business, right? So remember fringe benefits, it's over and above your, your, your uh, normal remuneration or your salary and, and wages. So now it's asking us to evaluate the impact. The minute you see the word impact, think of advantages and disadvantages. All right, so let's first look at uh, the advantages. So attractive fringe benefit packages may result in higher employee retention or reduces employee turnover. All right, so we're going to see that when we have really good fringe benefits, right, employees aren't going to want to leave. So uh, there are some companies that uh, were giving uh, fringe benefits to their, their employees that if they achieved a certain uh, uh, target in terms of sales, they'd get a free um, all expenses paid ticket to, to go to Tomorrowland with a friend of theirs, right? So that's like a fringe, a fringe benefit there. So why would, why would the employee want to leave when he potentially, or he or she potentially, could go to Tomorrowland? So you're gonna see your employees will, will, will stay at the company, right? The less uh, staff turnover you have, the more productive your workforce is gonna be, the more productive your, your company is, the more profitable and sustainable your business would be. The next one, it attracts qualified, skilled or experienced employees who may positively contribute towards the business goals and objectives. Uh, so if we, we attracting employees that are, are getting good fringe benefits, they're going to want to stay there. You're going to get like, the best um, employees. So if you look at some of the big um, uh, corporate giants in, in Silicon Valley, uh, they, they give their employees um, um, massive fringe benefits. So you, you get free food, you get uh, massages, they'll do your, your washing for you, you can go play games, you work in, like uh, they've got uh, free, free um, transport for you. So it attracts very qualified um, uh, p uh, potential employees, which means that your productivity is going to go. Because uh, people are like, right, at this company, they're going to look after us. Um, it increases employee satisfaction or loyalty as they'll be willing to go the extra mile for the business. So the business is like, right guys, um, we're giving you free, uh, free food, as much food as you want. Uh, you can do your laundry with us. Um, you you um, get uh, free transport. So now the employees are like, right, well the company is going the extra mile for me Therefore, I'll go the extra mile for the company. All right, so think of it um, as those teachers that you, that you might have that go the extra mile for you, you will always go the extra mile for them. It's the same scenario now. The business is going the extra mile for the employees, so therefore the employees will go the extra mile for the business. It improves productivity, right? Something I've mentioned already, resulting in, uh, in higher profitability, right? So the more productive we are, the more profitable we're going to be, right? and that's going to lead to more sustainability of the business. Uh, businesses save money as benefits are, are tax deductible. Right? So in terms of uh, going to that example that I gave you with uh, that Silicon Valley corporate that gives their employees um, free food. Right? So the food is then an expense for the business, which is tax deductible. So now that organization will be paying less tax However, if you look at the flip side, how much goodwill have they bought with the employees? So it's completely worth it for them. Now they're paying less tax and they've got more goodwill with their employees. And the last uh, positive, fringe benefits can be used as leverage for salary negotiations. So they might not be able to physically pay you more money, but they, um, the organization can say, yeah, but you're gonna have all of these other benefits that'll be available to you. Uh, so you might not be getting paid more money, but then you're not gonna be paying money for, for food when you, when you go to work, so that's, that's a saving for you. You're gonna have um, company transport, 
that's another saving for you. Uh, you'll be able to do your, your washing and laundry for free at, at the company. That's another saving for you. So even though they might not be able to match you in terms of um, actually paying you cash compared to another company, but they can like sweeten the deal by offering you fringe benefits, which you'll be able to take advantage of. All right, now if we look at uh, the negatives or the disadvantages, so fringe benefits are additional costs that may result in cash flow problems. All right, so all of these fringe benefits, they come at a cost, so that now that's going to be an additional cost for the organization. If that's an additional cost for the organization, that could um, hamper their, their cash flow. Also could um, um, be, uh, uh, put them in a poor situation in terms of if there's, a, if there's a downturn in the economy where a lot of companies try and cut all the costs that they can, and now you've given your employees these fringe benefits, um, can't just take it away from them straight away, so now it's going to be an additional expense and a cost for you. Administrative costs increase as benefits need to be correctly recorded for, for tax purposes. So I might need to employ someone uh, to, to run our, our, our benefits for our organization. So, so that's a, um, another, another cost there because we've got to make sure that everything is recorded properly, as I said, for, for tax benefits because we don't want to be seen to not be paying our, our fair share of tax. Firstly, it's, uh, it's not ethical. Secondly, we also don't want to um, be giving our employees an extra tax bill because otherwise those fringe benefits um, kind of uh, write each other out uh, because now our employees have to pay more, more tax there. All right. And it decreases the business profits as uh, incentive packages or remuneration costs are, are higher. All right. So Yes, we, we paying, we're paying more for these fringe benefits now, so now there's going to be less, uh, less profit for the business because that's seen as an additional expense. However, on the flip side, um, you have to see, right, maybe be, it might be an additional expense for us, but we're going to see the productivity of our employees go up. All right? So just, just bear that in mind there. Um, it can create conflict and uh, lead to corruption. Uh, if allocated unfairly, right, so I might be like, why um, is that person getting a, a ticket to Tomorrowland and all you giving me is a cup of uh, coffee uh, as my fringe benefit? Right, so it could create conflict in that I don't think that um, that person should be getting that fringe benefit and I'm not getting that fringe benefit. It could also be uh, open to, to corruption, maybe like, uh, my friend is in charge of the benefits and he gives me a whole bunch of benefits that I'm not entitled to that other people can't get. They're going to get very upset by that and they are going to um, um, launch a grievance or there could be conflict in the worst workplace, which we don't want. Workers only stay with the business for fringe benefits and may not be committed or loyal to the task of the business. Uh, so going back to that example of that employee that uh, was promised that if they reached their sales target, they will get um, a free all expenses paid um, trip to Tomorrowland. Uh, they might just be staying there for that. Uh, so they might have got their sales um, target within six months, and then afterwards they're like, why do I need to work harder? I've, got, I've already qualified for, for my special fringe benefit and then they, they're not productive at work there, right? And they're only staying there for the fringe benefit. All right, businesses who offer employees different benefit plans may create resentment uh, with those who receive uh, less benefits resulting in lower productivity. Right, so that's just coming where, where people are maybe jealous that other people are getting such good uh, fringe benefits and then you might have workers that say, well, Seeing that I'm not getting such an amazing fringe benefit, then I'm not going to work harder, and that's going to lower the productivity of the business. And businesses who cannot offer fringe benefits fail to attract the skilled workers. Uh, so if you cannot um, uh, offer amazing fringe benefits, we're, going to, we're not going to have workers that want to come uh, and work for us because they might be like, well, I can go to another company, and they're going to offer me even better fringe benefits. Uh, businesses have to pay advisors or attorneys to help them create benefits that comply with legislation, 
which just means that it's another additional cost for the business. Uh, and errors in benefit plans may lead to costly lawsuits or regulatory fines. So maybe we're going to have one of our, our employees that's going to want to sue us because we, uh, we, we gave out the wrong benefits, which is going to be bad public relations for the business, and it's not going to be good for the business at all. All right, now we're going to discuss the, the impact of TQM if it's poorly implemented uh, by, by the business. So the first is uh, when we're setting unrealistic deadlines that may not be achieved. Right? So when you, when you give people a deadline and it's unrealistic, people aren't going to put their heart and soul into that and it's not going to uh, end well for, for the business. Employees may not be adequately trained, resulting in poor quality products. Right, so if I start out um, a, a, a factory that wants to make uh, new cell phones, but I don't know anything about cell phones and I haven't trained my employees properly, they're not going to make proper quality products, which is going to result in us losing sales. Right, there's going to be a decline in productivity because of stoppages, right, and businesses may not be able to make necessary changes to satisfy the needs of their consumers. So we might not have what we need to actually give the consumers what they want. And if we can't give the consumers what they want, what they're going to do, they're just going to go to our competitors. The reputation of the business may suffer because of faulty goods or, or poor service. So no one wants to deal with that business. Therefore, there's no sales, no profitability. All right. Customers will have many alternatives to choose from, and the impact could be devastating to the business. Uh, if you aren't going to satisfy the needs of your customers, someone else is going to. Uh, investors might want to withdraw their investments if there is a decline in profits, and then a bad publicity due to poor quality products um, supplied. Uh, so you might see that in the press, a lot of people are going to say, right, these guys don't know what they're doing. No one wants to be a part of uh, your business, then. and especially in the, in the day and age of social media, where bad publicity can go viral in a heartbeat. There will be a decline in sales as returns from unhappy customers increase and high staff turnover because of poor skills development. Employees don't want to be a part of that organization and therefore they want to leave because they're tired of getting shouted at by customers for poor quality products. And then undocumented quality control systems or processes could result in an error or deviations from the preset quality standards. Uh, so if there's errors, uh, then the business is not going to be achieving what they should be achieving. Uh, we're gonna, uh, I'm going to head you back to Looney, and we'll chat with you guys now. Thank you, Dave. Matric, let's take a quick break. Please don't forget to enter the competition, and we'll see you straight after this. Welcome back from the break, Matrix. Thank you so much for joining us. We are still helping you with the exam prep for the upcoming exams. Thank you, Dave, and over to you. Hi, Matrix. Welcome back. We're busy on paper one with the emphasis on business operations. So let's go on to question six. So Stratum Leather, Leather is Limited is a large business that specializes in the manufacturing of quality leather, right? So quality is our key term there. They often upgrade their production processes to stay ahead of their competitors. And customers are always requested to provide feedback about their products. So if we look at what is the question asking from us, identify the total quality management elements applied by SLL. Motivate your answer by quoting from the scenario above. Use the table below as a guide to answer the question. So they want to know what TQ elements we are going to be discussing, as well as the motivation, which is going to be the quotes. All right, so the first uh, TQM element is continuous improvement to processes and systems. So they often upgrade uh, their production processes to stay ahead of their, their competitors. Right, so if we look, um, uh, they're looking to make sure that they've got the, the best uh, production systems in, so that might be new ways of, of uh, making leather bags or coming out with, uh, with new machinery. So that's going to give them a competitive advantage 
over, over their competitors because maybe they can make their leather bags in a, in a quicker manner uh, or, or perhaps they can actually um, make uh, their leather bags at a, cheaper, at a cheaper cost, which is going to result in, in more profitability um, uh, for them, which is going to result in that competitive edge over their competitors. The next TQM element is total clients or customer satisfaction. So customers are always uh, requested to provide feedback about their products. Uh, don't forget to add your quotation marks in there so that you don't use those marks there. So if we look, they are always asking their, their customers, how can we improve? How can we, um, how can we make this better? Um, you know, what, what are you looking for from the product? There. So if you look, when the customers are completely satisfied, what are they going to do? They're going to tell their friends, they're going to tell their work colleagues about that, and then other people are going to want to try um, your, your product or your service because they've heard the word of mouth from very satisfied customers there. Your customers might also give you a great idea on how to um, make your product even better. So, and if your, if your customers feel that they are valued and their opinion counts, you're also going to have a lifelong uh, customer, which is going to result in more sustainability for the business because there's going to be more profitability. So we look at the, the second part of the question is evaluate the impact of one of the TQM elements identified in question 6.1 on Stratum uh, uh, Leathers Limited um, at, on a large business. So if we look at the first one on the impact of continuous improvement of processes and systems on large businesses. So the positives is they have more resources to check on quality performance in each unit because now they, they are a bigger business, they've got more resources, so maybe they've got um, x-ray scanners that can look at uh, the quality of, of the leather to make sure that there's no defects in it which might cause the leather to split and then people aren't going to be happy with the goods that they've bought there which is very different to a small business that might just have enough resources to just make the bag they don't have the resources needed to quality inspect the bag um, if there's enough capital resources are available for new equipment required for the processes and system so there's a, a new machine that's come out that can um, make the bags in a, in a foster manner. Right? They have those resources and whereby they can go and buy that new machinery which is going to help their business. Um, they may have a person that is dedicated to the improvement of processes and, and systems. So they, they'll have like an innovation department where they, can, where they have one person that their whole role in the organization see right how can we make things better so it's that one person's just their whole job is to make sure that the whole system is a lot more efficient and they're willing to take risks or try new processes or systems because they're able to absorb the impact of of losing money right so they're going to take a risk like maybe um if we try this new process it's going to pay off for us if not then um then uh, we'll try something new, but they have enough money to take that, that risk or, or that gamble without them like um, gambling or, or risking the entire enterprise. They can afford to use the services of, of quality circles to stay ahead of uh, their, their competitors. Right? So they've got these quality circles which makes them stay ahead of their competitors, which is going to give them that competitive advantage. Um, if we look at our negatives now, large-scale manufacturing can complicate quality control. Right? It's very easy if I'm only producing one hamburger a day, I can look at, uh, at the quality of, of that burger. However, if you look at some of our, our big uh, burger fast food chains, they're producing millions of burgers every single day. So how are you going to actually make sure that all the burgers that are going out of the quality that's expected there. So when we're a big organization, quality can, uh, can be complicated by the amount of units that we are producing. Systems and processes take time and effort to implement as uh, communication and buy-in may delay the, the process. Right? So if I'm bringing in a new process, it's going to take time. I have to communicate how this new process is going to work. And we might have people who are resistant to uh, changing that process. So I have to get them to buy in, so it's going to take a lot longer. Um, the risk of changing part of the business 
that are, are actually working well. So um, there's an old saying, if it's not broke, then, uh, then why are we fixing it? So we might have a system that's working really well and we change it and then it doesn't work as well anymore. Um, and not all negative feedback from employees and customers is going to be accurate, which may result in incorrect or unnecessary changes to systems and processes. So a, a client or a customer might have been having a bad day when they gave us uh, that, that feedback and it's not particularly relevant to us but because we, we take what the customer has to say uh, wholeheartedly, we take that into account and it may impact us negatively. Uh, if we look at uh, the impact of total um, client customer satisfaction on large businesses, so the positives is it uses market research or customer surveys to measure or monitor customer satisfaction uh, or, or customers' needs. Right, so that market research is going to tell us, right, this is what the customers want. So if you look, there was a, a cell phone uh, manufacturer um, 10 years ago. They had actual physical um, buttons on their, on their, on their um, keypads where other cell phone manufacturers went for touch screen. So customers didn't want those, those phones with the physical buttons because if you dropped it in the sand, you could hear it grating every time that you, that you operated your phone. We're on the touch screen. It doesn't have that. And if they had listened to what their customers are saying, perhaps that cell phone company would still be around today. Uh, you continuously promote a positive um, company image, right? Because we're looking to improve our products. Customers are like, right, these, um, this business is listening to us. They're giving us what, what we're asking for. And that's going to mean that you going to have this positive image because every time your product or service is just getting better and better. Um, we may achieve a state of total customer satisfaction if a business follows sound business practices that incorporates all stakeholders. Uh, so our customers are going to be completely satisfied with, with the products or services with, that we produce, how we treat our stakeholders. They're going to want to be associated with us which is going to be an awesome uh, way to make sure that the business continues on its path of sustainability because everyone's like, right, these guys actually know what they are doing. We strive to understand and fulfill customer expectations by aligning cross-functional teams across uh, critical processes. Uh, so we, like, we make sure, right, we're marketing, what, uh, what do the customers want, right? Um, Production. This is what, uh, what the customers are looking for. This is how uh, we want to infuse our product or service. This is how you have to make it for them. Right, so you're going to have a whole bunch of different teams that are going to be working together in order to satisfy what the customer wants. Um, it ensures that cross-functional teams understand its core competencies and develop strategies to strengthen it. So teams understand right what makes us good and how can we ensure that we, we carry on down that path, right? And it may lead to higher customer retention or loyalty, um, and the business may be able to charge higher prices because you know that um, yeah, the products you're producing are quality and that they've actually been listening to their customers. Um, and they may be able to gain access to a global market, and it may lead uh, to increase competitiveness and profitability because we're supplying what the customers actually want. Uh, if we look at our negatives, employees who seldom come into contact with customers often do not have a clear idea of what will satisfy their needs. Right? So if you're just working behind a, a screen right, you, and you don't interact with your customers, you actually don't know what they want. Right? You think you know what they want, but that might be very different to actually what they want. Uh, monopolistic companies have an increased bargaining power so they do not necessarily have to please uh, the customers. So where there's very little competition in an industry, right, you'll see that those businesses aren't worried about customer service. They, they know that you can't go anywhere else, so they just give you poor customer service and you have to accept it because there is no alternative. And not all employees may be involved or committed to, to total uh, client satisfaction. Right? So if, if not all of your employees are, are, are committed and, and want uh, to 
build up the business through total client satisfaction, you're not going to have that there. So you have to have the buy-in of all of your employees. All right, so we're going to go on to uh, multiple choice questions now. So a small group of voluntary workers that meets regularly to discuss quality related matters in the workplace. Uh, you have your options as quality circle, shop stewards, quality managers, and employee representatives. And the answer is quality circle. All right, so they're going to sit and say, right, how can we bring in more quality into the business? How can we make the product or service even better? Our next question, the process of matching new employee skills and abilities with the requirements of a job is known as a placement, right? So we're going to make sure that we're putting the right people with the right skills in the right job there. So it's like I, if I'm a defender uh, in, a, in a soccer team, I'm not going to be, uh, um, my coach won't place me as a striker because I'm not about scoring goals, I'm about preventing goals. So making sure that we're putting the right people in the right positions. All right, and then uh, question nine, businesses use quality to direct key processes so that the correct quality standards are met. So we've got control, management systems, assurance or performance, and the answer that we're looking for there is management systems. So then we're putting in the, the correct quality management systems to make sure that the whole process works. All right, guys, as we come to, uh, to uh, the end of today's uh, lesson, please make sure that you go through past exam papers, go through section A, section B, section C, and practice them. Uh, you'll often always have the memos that you'll be able to download as well, so practice, see the type of questions that they're asking, understand what, they, what they're asking uh, from you, um, make sure that you guys get, get enough sleep. You need at least eight hours sleep so that you're feeling fresh uh, um, for, for your exams in the morning. Make sure you read your instructions very carefully. You only have to answer um, two questions for section B and you only have to answer one question for section C. Don't go and do extra questions. They're not going to count and you're just going to waste your time. Also remember, you can start your paper with any question you want or any section. So if you feel you want to start with your essay first, you can start with your essay first. Just make sure you adhere to, to your time allocation so that you're not wasting any time. And finally, guys, good luck. I hope you guys go and absolutely crush it tomorrow. Rooney, back to you. Thank you, Dave. Matrix, we're wishing you everything of the best for your exams. We hope you guys are going to do well. Please use our resources to study and prepare yourselves. Congratulations to all of our competition winners who will be announced on Facebook after the show. And if you missed any lessons, they are available on our YouTube channel. And you can check out our schedule on www.wasamatrix.co.za. Thank you so much, guys, from me, Looney, Nicolene, and Dave. Goodbye. Twenty twenty. Congratulations for being so brave, so committed, and for staying the course during one of the most difficult years in our history. We're here to support you all the way. Our Was a Metric campaign was set up to support you up until the eighth of December twenty twenty. We are offering you interactive exam guides, shows on SABC three, DSTV, Catch Up and OVHD channel 122 that are not to be missed. I wish you all the best in your final exams. You are the hope and the future of our country and we're so proud of you for coming this far. No matter the outcome, you are the finish line. Now give it your very, very best and I thank you. <laughs>